Yeah, so great that you are here, Graham. Thanks for coming. You are the Global Managing Director and Media Analytics of Affectiva. Um, yeah, you are a real expert in psychology, in neuroscience, brand and advertising uh, consulting. That's why you are here, of course. You are a thought leader in the application of cognitive science to marketing topics. And you have been for Milbert Brown and also Kantar. Um, for many years and now your recent experience actually uh, extends to the application of digital behavioral data. There's a strange noise. Yeah, your recently experience it, it uh, extends to the application of digital behavioral data in brand research and automated research solutions. And with iSquare, I think you have been a long-time friend we uh, have. of we Gareth, have. and you also know Andreas, our CTO. And we are collaborating and working together with Affectiva, um, delivering projects for Kanta and many other clients. So please welcome Graham with your great talk today, Reach versus Relevance, measuring the right kind of attention. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to uh, both, the, both the opening presentations, which were fantastic, and I'm not quite sure how I follow, follow some of those things, so, um, but we'll see. So uh, I think Lisa's presentation was great in giving a, a, a perspective from, if you like, the consumer's point of view. My, my talk talks more about attention from the point of view of, of the advertiser, but you'll be glad to know I do also end with talking a little bit about how, how advertisers can reward the attention that they take from, from consumers while, while browsing. So really I'll cover uh, kind of, you know, how best to measure attention, how much it matters, and, and as I said, what advertisers can do uh, to reward it. So... With that in mind, um, you know, attention, we're all here because we, we think attention is important, so I don't have to make, make that case to anybody here. Um, but it's also complicated. Now, I, I, I loved uh, uh, Michael's av avatar's definition of attention, and I think that's certainly one that, that I can get on board with. But I think not everybody in the industry shares the same definition of attention. And, and there was a, a recent uh, a paper by the ARF that reviewed all the literature on attention in marketing. Uh, and it, it really came to the conclusion that there isn't really a consistent definition. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is partly because there are so many different academic models of attention, all of which have kind of different nuances. And uh, you, you, you probably know this better than me, so I won't go into, into the detail on these. But a, another issue is also that because there's so much interest in attention measurement now, as, you know, and, and certainly if I were an advertiser spending millions of dollars on a campaign, I'd want to know if people are actually paying attention to all those impressions that I'm paying for. What's that, what that has meant is that there are so, there's now a huge explosion in the ways of measuring attention and lots of different businesses doing it in different ways. So all the way from pure behavioral impressions and views through claimed recall, through eye tracking, facial coding, which is what Affectiva does, um, and we'll talk more about that in a second, through to biometrics uh, and predicted measures. So there's a lot of different ways of measuring attention, all of which are potentially measuring subtly different things. But everybody seems to agree that it's important. Now, I think our, our our view is that we would put that into, put attention into a wider context. Of course, attention is important. You know, you can't be influenced by advertising that you pay no attention to, but that is only one step in what is a much longer process, all the way from the viewability of an ad through to paying simple attention, through to engaging with it, that having an impact on memory, and those memories having an impact on, this, on consumer decision making. And from our perspective at Affectiva, what I think is really important to ensure we keep measuring is emotional engagement and the emotional engagement of consumers with that content. Because emotions are a massive cue for attention. They sustain the attention that, that people pay to advertising and to content. They strengthen the memories of that advertising and that content in people's minds. And they can positively frame decision making at a later date. So attention is one piece of the puzzle, but there are other things as well. Now that said, attention really matters and we need to measure it uh, effectively. And one of the things that I think is, is an interesting perspective was uh, something I, I, I saw Dwayne Varon from Media Science present um, at a recent ARF presentation, uh, ARF conference, where he was talking a lot about measuring inattention and that being something that's actually relatively straightforward and 
relatively consistent thing to do. And his argument was, and I have some sympathy for it, was you know, attention is kind of on and off. It's not a linear construct. But also, there are a lot, because there are lots of different potential ways of measuring active attention and lots of different things, therefore, that are being measured, inattention actually offers the opportunity to be something which could be quite consistent. And we've kind of taken some of that on board in the way that, that, that we've chosen to measure uh, attention at Affectiva. So our view, I guess, is probably threefold when it comes to, to measuring attention. One, I think there's, you know, the, some of the best ways of doing it involve measuring real people's reactions. It involves behavioral measurement rather than just simple attitudinal measurement. And it involves methods that can be applied at scale outside the laboratory. So just to, to unpack that a little bit, um, there are lots of people, I'm sure there are people here that have predictive models of attention and they absolutely have a role uh, in the industry in terms of taking content and trying to estimate whether that will draw people's attention or not. But I think when we look at those measures and we look at how they compare to real people's reactions, I think it becomes clear there are certain aspects of attention that they won't capture. And in particular, one, one thing I would draw attention to is the idea of novelty. So the essence of really great disruptive advertising content is often doing something new and different. But as any AI company will tell you, novelty and different and something that sits outside the experience of the model is one of the things that it struggles to deal with. And we, we know that because we're an AI company as well. So I think those things will absolutely be useful for um, measuring lots of content at scale, but there'll be some aspects of attention that they can't always capture. So I think we have to and we have to go and research real people as well. Uh, measures like self-report, I think, are, are, are useful in that regard. But again, they, they often focus on outcomes, like, uh, like memory, rather than the attention paid in the moment while people are exposed. So to get at that, we need uh, measures that are more behavioral or biometric. But that itself brings a problem, because obviously many of the really interesting measures of, of attention that you get from biometrics uh, can you know, struggle to be extended beyond the lab. So you can't apply them at a lot of scale. So we'd argue that you know, we need to perhaps put some measures that can go outside the lab, but still measure, measure a lot of people at scale. And that's where I think companies, particularly computer vision companies such as Affectiva, uh, can help. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time just talking about how computer vision can be used uh, to, to help measure the, the, the attention and distraction. So, uh, we have many friends in the audience, so many of you know about Affectiva. Uh, we are, uh, we're within the, we've been in the marketing industry for over a decade. We're, we primarily have technology that focuses on uh, measuring facial reactions while people watch content and, and advertising, and we've been uh, used by many of the world's largest advertisers for many years. But two years ago, we were acquired by a Swedish company uh, that many of you will know called SmartEye. And what's interesting about that is SmartEye are uh, an eye tracking business. They make some of the best eye trackers in the world. And for our purposes here, what's interesting is that they've been used extensively over the last few years by the automotive industry to build um, eye tracking technologies to, bake, to put into production cars as measures of driver attention and driver safety systems. So that's interesting because obviously they have eye tracking, eye -tracking algorithms that don't, work, don't require any calibration. And that's interesting for us, because if we bring those together with measurement of facial expression, then we get potentially quite an interesting measure of attention that we can apply in the media industry. So that's, that's what we've done, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Measure of attention from our technology is to create something which is a combination of, of many different... Um, oh, <laughs> it's a combination of many different signals of, uh, of attention, uh, of, sorry, of distraction. So we... So the way our system is used a lot by partners such as Kantar uh, is that while you know, we integrate into survey research where people are exposed to, to advertising and, and then take questionnaires to respond to it, um, while people are recorded with their consent, we can then take those videos and look at the extent to which they seem to be orientated towards and paying attention to the content. And that takes into account kind of the angle of the head up and down, left and right. Uh, but also now using the smart eye technology, we are able to then build in uh, kind of the actual gaze of so where people are actually looking on the screen, plus other measures of distraction, such as uh, whether people are talking off camera, uh, whether people look like they're falling asleep, uh, or whether they have kind of covered up their eyes by drinking or you know, uh, some kind of facial, facial reaction. Uh, and as I said, the, what's interesting is the, the eye tracking here in this, or the vectors that are baked into that, uh, don't require a calibration. 
So I'll try and play the video. It may, it may coincide entirely with when the alarm goes off, so, so let's see. Um, but uh, you'll see on the video that I'm, I'm, I'm going to show, we, we're looking at my colleague Serena here, who's in the room. Hello, Serena. Uh, the, uh, when the line is high, that's uh, high tension. When the line drops down, then uh, you, you'll see low tension. I might actually just go back one and see if I can get it to play from the start, because you get to see me again, which obviously everybody wants to see. So you can see as I look away, the tension dro drops down. There's so I was looking at, looking at the screen. Um, Serena, yeah. perfect. It's okay. Can you still hear me? Okay. Okay, we'll keep going. So I'll play that again. I hope. There you go. So again, you can see as I look away, tension drops down um, uh, and then comes back again as I uh, as I face the screen again. Serena, in this case, is looking at content on a second screen, and again, we're able to kind of detect that. That, that she's off-centered to start with, but then as she looks away, the tension drops down. This is recorded on a mobile. This is uh, Matt Strafus, who some of you will know, as he kind of, again, looks away from his mobile phone. And again, as Serena looks away from her mobile phone, we see uh, attention signals drop. So you can begin to build in multiple measures of, of distraction. Um, here's one of our colleagues, again, looking down at his keyboard, which is a tricky thing to, to, to measure. Uh, and again, Serena, off-center gaze to start with, but then looks away, and we see, that, see the signal drop down. And then clearly, Serena's now chatting to a colleague. And so we've detected that, that that's, that's poor attention. Um, Mina appears to be falling asleep, so uh, <laughs> not paying attention. I'm, not, I'm sure none of you are. And then this is interesting. So one of our colleagues kind of covers, yeah, raises the cup, and you see we, we can't see her face, so she drops down. This is another colleague. Now you can see she's done the same thing, but she's still looking at the screen with one eye. And so again, the measure of attention stays high because she can, you know, if you can see the screen uh, in that moment. So as a... Um, uh, so as a measure of attention, I think computer vision can do some quite interesting things. Now, I know, I know this audience, so you're going to want to know accuracy rates. This, the chart on the left shows something about the accuracy of that um, measurement of attention compared to kind of just previously measures that we had that were just based entirely on head orientation. If we build in those multiple signals of distraction, uh, then again, you, can, you see a significant increase in accuracy of attention measurement. Chart on the right, obviously everybody here knows what that is. Calibra it looks like an uh, eye tracking calibration exercise. Those are the vector, an example of the vectors that are baked into the attention metric. But what we did, but, you know, some of you may think that looks a bit rubbish. That wasn't calibrated by asking people to do that. So that's all comes from the smart eye vectors. So this, I think some quite neat technology that you can bring together to, to measure attention. So that's all well and good. Right, great, you can do some interesting things with computer vision. But what does it actually say? What does it mean for advertisers? <laughs> Sorry, Dad. That's okay, Serena. It had to be. So what we'll uh, uh, so what we'll what we'll do is I'll just show you an example of a couple of ads, uh, and you will kind of see the sorts of sort of insights that can be can be revealed. Uh, hopefully, you can see the chart. Okay. So this is an ad for um, True Classic that was on TikTok that we tested with Cantar. Thank you again for Cantar's help with this. Uh, there's a couple of things to show. This shows the. Um, change in attention as people watch the content. In green, it's a total sample. What's interesting is the blue line, and you can just about see the red line, I hope. Blue line is those that felt the ad was well-branded. The red line was those that didn't think it was well-branded. And you'll see, particularly during branding moments, attention really drops off for the people that didn't get the brand uh, in the interview. So we'll just play this. I'm so fat. Brendan, you're not fat. It's the shirt. Look at Nate. His true classic is tight around the chest and shoulders and arms, and then it tapers off towards the bottom. Nate also has six-pack abs. The point is, the shirt doesn't highlight your best attributes. What about best attributes? You're a really good dad. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Branding mainly at the end, and you can see that dip down. Uh, in attention that, that, every, that people tend to show, particularly those that don't get the brand. So, you know, you can get some interesting insights, I think, out of both kind of measuring attention, but also diagnosing the, the consequences. I'll show you um, another example as well, which is for, um, uh, it's a movie trailer for the film Beast. Anybody seen the film Beast? Came out last year? Yeah, not that many people did, but we'll, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll have a look and, and I'll show you uh, a couple of insights from that. Hey, look out the window. We'll watch the trailer Welcome first. to my party, guys. I can see now the rain is gone. Thank you so much for having us. This is my chance to reconnect with the girls. I can see all the Did mom shoot some of these? This little bump right here? That's you. I still miss her every day.
What's that? There's something crossing up ahead. Keep the girls in the car. Stay in the car. Okay, just stay in the car. But I... Diabolo. Okay, what's he saying? Diabolo means devil. I've never seen anything like this. Multiple attacks without eating his prey. Lions don't do that. At least no lion I've ever seen. Shh. Go back to the calls. Dad, can I have please? the jungle. It's the only law that matters. Dad, they've got guns. You shouldn't be out here. What are you doing? Stop! Stop! I've got to get my girls out of here. I need you to trust me right now. I'm coming back. Don't move, okay? Where did he go? So, that's one of those trailers that feels like you've seen the whole film, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, you might have thought that why is he showing such a long video? Well, I think a lot of people felt slightly like that. So this is the attention, these are the attention results of people that, that watch that, that trailer. And you can see a couple of things straight away. The attention, result, the attention drips down and down and down and down throughout the content. But what's interesting here is, is we split it by those people that said that they were involved in the trailer and really interested in it and those that said they weren't. And you can see actually, particularly as we get into the back half as it seems to go on a bit, it's kind of the people that are less involved are showing lower levels um, uh, of attention. And interestingly also, if you look at the people that are kind of fans of romance movies, perhaps not the target for this, uh, for this film, but the people who, versus the people who are fans of action and adventure. Again, the people who are fans of romance movies show less attention throughout, and again, particularly start disengaging once you get into the, the kind of the more dramatic sequences with the lion uh, and, and the conflict. So I think you can begin to get some quite interesting measures of attention out of these kind of uh, computer vision uh, technologies. However, I just want to cover two, two more points. The first kind of slightly comes back to what I said at, at the start. You know, there is a difference between looking and seeing. This quote is actually from my daughter's driving instructor when she, he was trying to see, uh, make her look at in her mirrors properly. Uh, and it, there is a clearly a difference between looking somewhere and actually really engaging with the content. Attention is a necessary but not sufficient um, condition for advertising success. And this analysis, I think, kind of illustrates this well. And uh, I feel slightly guilty presenting this. This is actually by Duncan Southgate, who sat in the room. So this is, thank you, Duncan, for, uh, for allowing us to share this. Um, but this is, uh, this is analysis by Kantar looking at uh, the sales performance of uh, hundreds of ads from their database, but split into different groups based on the performance of those ads on different measures. So if we look at simple, just kind of, a simple measure of attention, orientation towards the screen. The ads that do well on that tend to have slightly higher sales effects than those that do, do poorly. It's clearly a, a positive relationship there. But if you then actually start looking at measures of engagement, in this case based on people's facial expressions, how much they kind of are expressive as they watch the content, you begin to see the differences get bigger. So that makes a bigger difference. And then when you combine attitudinal measures, attitudinal responses to the content, the difference gets bigger and bigger uh, even further. So clearly, we need to measure attention effectively, but it will only go so far in helping us explain sales effectiveness uh, of advertising. And it's not just Kantar that have, uh, where we've seen relationships between the actual expressiveness that people show on their faces while they watch content and sales success. The chart on the left, I won't go into detail, the chart on the left is analysis we conducted with Mars uh, some years ago that showed that you know, uh, ads that generate lots of positive expressions while people watch are more associated with positive sales effects. Chart on the right shows 
a recent bit of modeling we did um, across thousands of cases showing that you can predict the motivational power of advertising based on facial reactions while people watch. So attention absolutely is important, but we need to, to go uh, a little further. And my final point I want to make, I think, comes back to something Lisa was saying, which is advertisers tend to approach this question of attention slightly the wrong way around, in my view. It's the question the industry is asking is mainly, how do we make sure that people pay attention to our ads and not all this other stuff that's on the screen? You know, it's almost like the content is the clutter. Actually, it's the other way around. It's the ads that are the distraction. We're not on our phones to watch ads. We're not on websites and, and so on to, to watch ads. We're usually doing something more instrumental. We're trying to achieve some kind of goal. And that has important consequences when we think about it that way. And I apologize for the um, graphics on this slide, but this is work that's about 20 years old. Um, back then, I did a lot of work with the uh, Center for Experimental Consumer Psychology at the University of Bangor in Wales. They had a really great department uh, run by a lady called Professor Jane Raymond. And she shared some work that they did, they were doing at the time that's always stayed with me, which is some really interesting experimental work that shows that if you ask people to complete a task and then distract them with something. If they have to actively ignore something to complete that task, let's say you're, you've got to spot a face with particular characteristics and you show lots of other faces around it with, that might have conflicting characteristics. When you ask people afterwards to rate the things which they had, they had to ignore, they automatically downrate those things. We emotionally dislike things that are distracting us from what we're trying to do. So what that means for advertising is that all, every time we're interrupting someone's feed or scroll, that advertising is start, has a hurdle to overcome. It's starting behind the eight ball in some regards. So that means we have to give something in exchange for that distraction. We have to give people content that they want to engage with that's actually meaningful in some way for them. And just one, one final point before I close on how that's done. There's a whole pre you can do a whole presentation on what's engaging for, for people, what, what, what draws them in in terms of advertising, advertising effect. But one thing that, again, we found over the years is always that things like advertising narrative are really powerful. So it's ads that tell stories often are much more engaging than the ones that, that don't. So the bars on the left come from an analysis I did probably 15 years ago where we took hundreds of ads, coded them manually to, as to whether they tried to tell a story or whether they were a series of vignettes and just an argument. And the ads that told a story were more engaging both for the facial measures but also on, on attitudinal measures. And you, you still see that today. I mean, the, there's, a, there's data there, again, from a, a, a pilot project we ran with Kantar looking at the recent um, Can Lion winning ad for Apple, RIP Leon, in this ad. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, guy thinks, guy's asked to look after his, fr his uh, friend's lizard. He thinks he's killed it, so he sends him a text. And then just as he sent the text, the lizard bursts back into life, and he has to unsend the text. So we see facial, facial reactions to that, um, a brow furrow and smile. While everybody's worried that, that the, the lizard's dead, we see lots of brow furrows. As soon as he bursts back to life, we see uh, lots of smiles and engagement. So narrative structure can be, just an example, of narrative structure can be really powerful in, in rewarding the attention that we, we, we ask people to give. And I think also, finally, to come back to my other point, therefore, we've got to get me the measurement of attention right, but we need to, to go beyond that. And again, that kind of narrative, the idea that people respond to narrative, again, is something that potentially some of the more predictive models might struggle with. So to sum up, um, hopefully we've been clear that, you know, like everybody here, we agree that attention matters. But I think from our perspective, we want to make sure we're, I think we should at least as kind of ground truth and, and, and in many cases measure real people's reactions that we can then collect at scale with, with behavioral measures. Computer vision can help, so we can, we can, if we particularly focus on distraction, I think come up with some quite powerful measures, but we have to measure um, engagement with the content, not just whether people are looking, and we have to, as advertisers, reward that, that attention that we're encouraging people to give us, otherwise we are just engaging in, in dark patterns. So, great. Thank you for your attention. So, we have time for one question. <laughs> no, all good. Is there a question from the audience? No questions? Stand silence. Stand silence. Hello. As usual. Um, can we watch the ad 
um, with the results of the facial coding, with the, with, um, can lie, the can lion winner. Uh, Do you have a here? I can, I can show you later. Yeah, I can show. And um, another thing, you were talking about the narrative and storytelling, which I, I would obviously agree with you. But how, and I think the example that you, you really show there is not necessarily, when, I think when creatives um, hear storytelling, mm -hmm. it seems that there's a long, um, a long commercial, right? Uh -huh. And I think, I think is, is it a matter of attention, you know, how you can hold the attention for that long? Because this one is a fantastic example of mm -hmm. a great narrative, sure, you know, and, and yeah. still delivering mm -hmm. a product um, mm -hmm. actually benefit. Yeah. So how, how, how is with the length and attention and rewarding, you know, these, yeah, these no, viewers? You know, it's, it's really interesting. I think you can, sometimes a longer ad isn't a better ad, right? And, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of creators do take that view of like, oh, great, I'm going to create a big, long digital ad, which I guess was more prevalent probably 10 years ago than now. Um, and it isn't always the case. You kind of saw with the Beast trailer that that kind of went on a little while. You know, that, that could have easily been half the length, a third of the length, and, and been more successful. So I think it doesn't have to, storytelling doesn't have to take a long time. In fact, some of the best ads, and arguably even the true classic ad is, a, is, is an example of that, where there was, a, there was a story there. It was quick and it was short, and it was engaging. So it doesn't have to be long, even if I think a lot of advertisers kind of assume it has to be. Was a, was really fantastic hearing hearing you. Thanks for sharing all these these examples. And uh, yeah, I was uh, I think like everybody else, more than impressed uh, on the accuracy of your systems mm -hmm. and the integration of Smart Eye. I know you are a super expert in, in branding and advertising. Um, but how would you apply that? Maybe, you know, going back to Lisa's talk, back mm -hmm. a little bit to the UX world. Mm -hmm. I know Smart Eye is in the, in the car, so mm -hmm. maybe some thoughts on UX, human experience research. Yeah, I, and it's a really fair point. I think certainly those kind of measures can be very helpful in the, in the UX um, field and certainly in understanding the extent to which perhaps some of the patterns that you talked about, Lisa, are, are, you know, are working and how they're working. I would... I would perhaps overlay on that, again, if you, if you go beyond just attention and measure the, if you like, the emotion, emotional consequences of that attention, I think we get into some really interesting spaces that, that can perhaps speak to whether advertisers are actually contributing to, to, to well-being or not. Um, some years ago, Affectiva launched an app which was unsuccessful. So we, no one ever talks about their failures, but this was a failure. We launched an app which was designed to help people understand which advertising, or sorry, which websites were making them happy and which ones weren't. So with their permission, we would, while they were browsing particular sites, we would record their facial expressions and then play back to them, OK, well, you would tend to be happier watching this than that or engaging with this website or that website. And we couldn't get the critical mass for the app, unfortunately. But it was an interesting application of exactly that kind of technology to say, OK, we may be able to help people, people's well-being in this case um, you know, by helping them understand themselves and how they're reacting. Thank you so much, Great. Graham. Thank you. <laughs> 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 we'll get a present.